Paul Ormerod, he would regard himself as an Austrian economist. Um, the wonderful little book, he did have it available free online, but he's taken it off, so I'm afraid you're going to have to buy it. Why most things fail. Entrepreneurs, they are not few and far between, and wonderfully clever, or lucky. Um, they are many, and they're mostly failures. And the metaphor here is with biological evolution. That the species that have been on this earth, most are extinct. And you can look at the detail across any economy over any hundred years, and the companies that were big at the start have disappeared at the end. <clears throat> In the neoclassical world, profits, supernormal profits, monopoly profits, are a bad thing and require government intervention. In the Austrian world, if the profits persist, then there's a reason to ask how, what are the barriers to entry? But mostly the profits are an ephemeral reward to being first to a new idea, which is, and the profits are quickly dissipated as the rest of the world rush, rushes in to, to, to copy whatever it is you've, you had a successful idea about. Um, that entrepreneurial efficiency stems not from rational planning. You sit down and you decide you've got so much capital, so much labor, and you can combine them this way and get an output and take it to the market. But from the ex post elimination of the failures. Bankruptcies are good. They are the attempts which unluckily, stupidly, didn't come off. Um, efficiency stems not from smart people within simple worlds, but from dull people within complex worlds. Okay, I've already spoken about that. Hayek is big on luck. You may just be lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time when the institutional structure changes and everybody wants your skills. With deregulation in the city of London, those few that had been working in the cartelized, stockbroking community suddenly found that their skills were scarce, short term. And they had golden handcuffs. Stay with us, we need you here. But, you know, but you can't obviously do very much about that. And Hayek says, rather that we ought to try. We allow the individual share to be determined partly by luck in order to make the total to be shared as large as possible. You get lucky. You get unlucky. Live with it. Right, the seminal paper from Hayek, Adam Smith showed the advantages from the division of labor specializing. Hayek does the same. Knowledge is not uniformly dispersed. It is divided. There are islands of diverse knowledge. And you tap into that by specializing. That phrase from Hayek is repeated all over the place. Particular knowledge of time and place. Planned socialist systems cannot tap in to the particular knowledge of time and place. Um, small artisans in a town like Lancaster, they know who to go to. Your electricians, your plumbers, 
your bricklayers, your chippies, your carpenters. It's not in a book, it's not in a telephone directory, not one that they use anyway. But if something is needed, they know who the guy is that can do it. And it's that kind of tacit knowledge, the entrepreneurial knowledge, which changes by the minute that free market systems allow you access to use. That if you insist on bringing everything to the centre for a decision, by the time the decision is made, the situation is gone cold. So entrepreneurship is a process of discovery and rediscovery, and constantly keeping the actions, the entrepreneurial actions, into some kind of harmonious interrelationship. Now Hayek is branded as the apostle of laissez-faire. All those on the left, Hayek, oh yes, he's that free market idiot. I don't know if I need to read all these out, they're all saying the same thing. Laissez-faire is not the ultimate and only conclusion. Nothing has done so much harm to the liberal cause as the wooden insistence on certain rules of thumb above all the principle of laissez-faire. Our main problems begin when we ask what ought to be the contents of property rights. Which contracts should be enforceable? How contracts? In other words, without an institutional structure, your laissez-faire is meaningless. <coughs> um, I used to go on a lot of walking holidays, and when you're together with people, a dozen of you, um, for any length of time, you get to know people very well. And one guy, big job in the city, and I stayed in touch with him for a long time, and I realised, of course, that I could never have flourished with that kind of pressure. He, water off a duck's back, know yourself. He told me that when the Soviet Union broke up, he, his firm, and many others, they wanted to do deals. There was so much to be done in the old Soviet bloc, but they couldn't find anybody to do deals with. There was no legal structure. There were no well-defined property rights. You had, you had local communist parties claiming ownership. You had central organisations. You had trade unions claiming ownership. You had the original owners claiming ownership. Without a trusted and enforceable system of property rights, Markets cannot work. Markets are redundant without an institutional structure, and your institutional structures are in the area of political science and political... Um, I suppose, I never thought about it, the, the, the oligarchs, the billionaires of this world, were the people with the local knowledge. The Western investment bankers who wanted to do deals in the old Soviet Union, they didn't have any information. They needed a well-defined, trustworthy, established structure. The oligarchs knew how to wheel and deal. They had the particular, they had the knowledge of the particular circumstance of time and place. Was that luck? Partly luck and partly brute force. I think I've got another slide at the same time. Oh, we come on now to Henry Plotkin. Um, when this book was first published, The Nature of Knowledge, I think it, 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 it was, well, it's been jazzed up since. And I think his publisher said, get on Richard Hawkins, Richard Hawkins, Richard Dawkins' coattail. You know, the uh, evolutionary biology. And when I, when I, I don't know how I came across that, but when I, when I read that, I thought, wow, this is, um, you know, this, this is a book I will always remember. Fantastic insights. Um, he, would, he would be hopeless with Ref 14 because he's, he's a psychologist, he's a biologist, um, he's an he's a, he's a evolutionist, he, he, you know, he, he would be out of Ref. He's, he's not well defined in terms of a single discipline. University College London. Um, the evolutionary theory applied to knowledge. Uh, he uses the word adaptationism because Evolution has a Victorian context of things getting better. 
things getting superior. It's not, not about things getting superior, it's, it's about things adapting um, one to another in, 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 in an improved way and constantly readapting. And so all knowledge is indirected adaptive action. And he says, you know, the, th the thick skin of the cactus is a kind of a knowledge of what it needs to do in order to survive in this, in this wilderness. So all knowledge is species specific. And he's probably never heard of Hayek, even now. I, I should write to him and ask him if he's heard of Hayek. Um, but the closeness of his three categories of heuristics the means by which we obtain knowledge are virtually identical to Hayek's uh, in uh, his, his last publication, which was put together really after his death, called The Fatal, Fatal Conceit. We have three means of understanding what goes on around us. And the first is our genetic adaptation. And None of us knows what it's like to be a bat. The knowledge that a bat has is in the bat. We can't access that. The knowledge is species specific. Because you and I are from the same cultural background, we are kind of comfortable with each other. But if I were painted up with bones from, you know, you would, you know, there's an assumption that when people are sort of behaving as you behave, that they are like you and they understand you and their, their, their knowledge is very much the same as yours. Some change is too rapid for biological, for genetic mutation to catch. And that is where intelligent learning comes in. You know, and, and the brain itself is an, is an evolving process. It's not simply evolving through childhood and adulthood, but it's evolving through new experiences. <coughs> and then the third is the cultural knowledge, the institutional structures. And we may have lost, I'm, I'm now moving from Plotkin to Hayek. There's a chapter in this book called Between Instinct and Reason. And between instinct and reason, there is our cultural inheritance. And it may not be obvious why you have certain dietary routines. It may not be obvious why you have certain cleansing routines. But the argument is that those routines have stood the test of time. So for some reason they survived. And you are in grave danger of simply sweeping them away because you don't understand or you can see no reason why they should still exist, that having gotten rid of them, you may discover why they did exist. And Plotkin makes the same point, that the tertiary heuristic is our culture, our institutional framework. And Hayek wrote an essay, why I'm not a conservative. He's not a conservative because he approves of change, but he approves of small change rather than revolutionary change. Everything to be tested, everything to be challenged, but not all at once. There are dangers in trying to do too much too quickly. It's a, a recent book by a, a journalist who now located in New York, well written. Anecdotes that I haven't come across before, I would recommend it. And he, and he was giving broadcasts on the radio and so on, I guess so. But I mean, does that look, with the, with, the, with the phrases that I pulled out there, as being somebody who is impartial in representing Keynes and Hayek? But every time we have a credit led boom and bunch, out comes Hayek in a comparison with Keynes. Keynes had a common sense understanding. Hayek's was intellectual rather than practical. Keynes saw economics as a means of improving the lives of others. Hayek consumed by economic theory for its own sake. Keynes confronted real life dilemmas. Hayek indulged in pure theory. Well, that's Hayek. You know. <laughs> we want to 
no equity. Nobody, stupid thing to say, few get Hayek's business cycle theory right. What shot? His best stab at it is, and I talked about Robertson Crusoe, if he hasn't done enough saving, he has to abandon his raft before it's complete because he hasn't got enough fish. Investment projects are abandoned because there is no demand for ice cream by the time ice trays for commercial refrigerators are complete. That is not the point. That is not the point. You still want the ice trays for the commercial refrigerators, but you haven't provided enough initial saving to complete the project. And the reason you haven't provided enough initial saving to complete the project is because you were led down this avenue not by real saving, but by cheap credit. You tried to do... You, it's as if Robinson Crusoe tried to build his raft on credit rather than salted fish. He needed the salted fish as saving to transfer into the investment of the raft. But the credit doesn't transfer into the raft. I think, okay, let's just, um, won't give you very much longer. He finally got the Nobel Prize, which he had to share with one of the few economists who warned about the possibility of the major crisis before the Great Crash came in the autumn of 1929. Um, here is what it's about. You have cheap credit, which means that interest rates are too low. So investment is apparently more remunerative. But it's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as all investments are more profitable. Rather, it's the fact that long-term investments are relatively a lot more profitable than short-term investments. So you switch to long-term projects. Robinson Crusoe starts to build a battleship, not a, not a run, not a sinner. Now, if you are busily building your long-term projects, you are switching resources from producing consumer goods more immediately. Robinson Crusoe is no longer fishing. So the price of fish starts to rise. And with that shortage and the rising price of fish, it's the price of fish relative to the price of the capital goods, which causes the switch back into short-term investments again. Now, I threw them at the back of the presentation because I had about five slides of DCF calculations just to give you an idea of how it, how it worked. I mean, you, you, you read this in terms of sentences and paragraphs in the language of the 1930s, and you think, it's kind of plausible, but it, you know, is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it robust? And then when you translate it into modern uh, investment appraisal presentation, you go, wow, yeah, it does work. It makes sense. So you just have to, have to keep it. Okay. That you've seen before. I said, I brought this early. Um, 1975 after the Eagle Marble Boom. But look at the date of this one. 1933. The general disinclination to explain the past boom by monetary factors has been quickly replaced by a greater readiness to hold bankers responsible. The present working of our monetary organisation. The same stabilizers. That's a dig at the Keynesians. This is before the general theory is published. Keynes's impact is being felt. The stabilizers. We need 
aggregate demand to be stabilized. The same stabilizers who believe that nothing was wrong with the boom and that it might last indefinitely because prices did not rise, now believe that everything could be set right again if only we would use the weapons of monetary policy to... This is criminalism. You know, the, the, the features are there throughout. No, not for my sound. Andrew Ronsley's talking over this. No more boob and bust. <laughs> we said this more than a hundred times about it. Anyway, we don't have the sound. Uh, that aphorism is attributed not only to Mark Twain. It's a good one. History doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it runs. So we have, as the Nobel citation credited Hayek in having foreseen, predicted the 1929 crash. A mild recession would have followed an ordinary boom. 1927, but easy money kept it going for another two years. Um, we have the stagflation of the 1970s, where the argument is now pitched in terms of shifting Phillips curves, trade unions, and unemployment. We have the dot com bubble of the 1990s. Um, and then we have the housing bubble. Um, in 2008. And this is my last slide. Once you're in a hole, there are no panaceas. There is no avoiding the pain of liquidating bad investments. But just as there are no atheists in the trenches, there are no Hayekians in the recessions. Thank you.